It's a particular pleasure uh, to welcome Liz and uh, the uh, moderator or questioner, Justine Curland, who will be joining her after her talk. Uh, Twilight Man has been greeted by critical praise since its publication several months ago. Kirk has called it an absorbing debut novel, a history, not, I'm sorry, debut book, not a novel, a history of power, corruption, greed, and betrayal, and the relentless persecution of homosexuals. This book tells the story of the life and times of Harrison Post. It moves across the United States to San Francisco, Hollywood, to wartime Norway, which makes it particularly relevant and why we're doing this event here at Scandinavia House, and to the Nazi prison camps. It's a powerful book. I've read it, I enjoyed it enormously, and I recommend it to you all if you haven't already had a chance to read it. So it's a great pleasure to have Liz here, to meet her, to congratulate her on a great book, and to hear what she has to say about the book. Um, she has a great background in writing. She has uh, appeared in a number of publications, including Book Forum, The New York Times, Slate, and Los Angeles Times. And she recently has been working on a project with the Norwegian uh, Literature Abroad program, another Scandinavian connection. She will be joined for questions afterwards by Justine Kurland, and Justine is known for her utopian photographs of American landscapes and their fringe communities. She has spent the better part of the last 20 years on the road. Her work is in the public collections of institutions, including the Guggenheim, the Museum of Modern Art, and the International Center of Photography. Currently, she is uh, departing from her road trips and uh, working on works that uh, contemplate her origins, her apartment in New York City, her hometown of Fulton, New York, and her mother's home in rural Virginia. So it'll be great to hear from Justine, but now I'd like to turn things over to Liz and welcome. We're eager to hear you. Oh, you're going first. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm just gonna do a, a second introduction. Um, I'm really uh, thrilled to be here and um, so excited that Liz asked me to share this moment of celebration with her. Um, so I wrote a little, a little something, not a writer. Um, I know Liz Brown uh, from teaching together at ICP's MFA program. She was there to save students from bad art writing and gave them prompts to write about their experiences, their memories, and where they were from. I remember how good their papers were while Liz was teaching. There's a particular Liz Brown invention in writing. It involves zooming in only to pull out again, digressions and speculations that open up space for thinking. The play between image and text and the acrobatic interweaving of queer theory, literature, and a larger historical context, interpreting events without ever interrupting the lives of her characters. Liz's new book, Twilight Man, Love and Ruin in the Shadows of Hollywood and the Clark Empire is the tragic story of Harrison Post, the lover of Liz's great, great uncle and millionaire Will Clark. We witness Harrison's fall from a life of glamour and wealth, surviving a Nazi prison camp only to spend his remaining years trying to recover his former fortune, dying destitute at 49. The question of inheritance is a major theme throughout the book, but Beyond financial inheritance, Liz trains us to become aware of cultural inheritance, those stories that provide continuity to certain groups of people from one generation to the next through conventions of naming that ultimately safeguard their liberty and life. The book begins with Liz's discovery of a photograph in her late grandmother's house that is decidedly outside of the family album. The generosity of Liz's writing is to let us into the process of decoding evidence in plain sight. Through this one photograph, Liz gets to a toehold, enough purchase to uncover the story her family has tried to bury. In doing so, she recovers her own inheritance, inheritance, a sense of belonging her family withheld since her coming out. I like to imagine her grandmother understood this in saving Harrison Post's photograph all those years. The book is the result of incredible labor, research into public records, cold calling, social media stalking, following hunches and careful combing of archives and the attentive reading of photographs. Liz contextualizes post-life with co contemporaneous cases of queer precarity, raids, blacklisting, entrapment, extortion, criminal proceedings, and the ubiquity of suicide. 
She writes, it's a bitter realization that in excavating queer lives, we so often excavate the loathing around those lives. Oscar Wilde appears throughout the book in an analogy of the love that dare not speak his name and for the metaphor of a picture of Dorian Gray, of the double life of appearances. For Harrison Post, evasion is a strategy of survival. Liz writes, Harrison's post life wasn't doubled, it was refracted. One medium moving through another, like a beam of light wrapped, I'm sorry, like a beam of light warped by, by water. He passes through society, his truth bending into something new. In thinking about the Twilight Man, I'm reminded of a question Edward Kodava asks in Notes on Love and Photography. What does love have to do with ruin, loss, and the dissolution of self? What does it mean to love a photograph? And in what way does love mean nothing else than loving a photograph? Is it even possible to love something other than a photograph? As the object of Will Clark's love, Harrison Post became an image. I wonder how much more important photography is in the case of queer love. So let's welcome Liz Branch. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Justine. Um, Norway was a, a utopia for Harrison Post. And um, I know we are very familiar with the concept of the American dream, but he had a Norwegian dream, which was to live in a modest villa with a housekeeper and his dog and a horse and uh, other modest uh, accoutrement, but, um, which unfortunately he did not achieve. But um, one thing he, one of the reasons he had this Norwegian dream was that um, when he arrived in Norway through ver a very convoluted passage, um, he discovered an in a country that greeted him with incredible generosity. So I, um, I have experienced that generosity in my research in Norway, and it's lovely to feel it today. So thank you. Um, and I want to thank Kyle and Victoria and Stefan, who are making all the, who are pulling all the strings behind the, in, uh, making this all work today. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here after such a long, long, long time. <laughs> so um, I also want to thank my brothers, Scott and Tom, who, are, who came here from California and arrived on Thursday. So um, we get to have a, a sibling reunion this weekend. Um, as Justine and Ed have mentioned, the book is a, a convoluted saga, and it's about greed and wealth and self-invention and exile. Um, but I think the simplest way to describe it is to say it is about two photographs. Um, it's about this photograph, which I found in my grandmother's dresser uh, after her death in 2003. And this is Harrison Post. Uh, he was born in New York City in 1897, and um, he was born Albert Weiss Harrison. His father was a, a Jewish clothing salesman who had a somewhat itinerant life. Um, and Harrison uh, ended up in San Francisco as a shop clerk himself in a luxury boutique, and um, fell in love with his, a very wealthy customer who came in one day whose name was William Andrews Clark Jr. And uh, Clark swept the shop clerk off to LA and uh, where he reinvented himself as a Hollywood millionaire named Harrison Post. And um, this photo is taken at the beginning of that invention. And let's see, my, this is the second photograph. Um, this is taken in 1946. It's uh, taken in San Francisco by a Hearst uh, photographer, and um, it was accompanying a news story about how Harrison had returned after being held captive in Europe during World War II and was back in the States trying to recover his fortune, which his sister Gladys had stolen from him. 
And I think of Twilight Man um, being about how, uh, if I can get you back, this man became this man. Uh, if you've read the book or heard me talk at all about any of the, uh, about any of this, what I'm going to tell you will already be familiar, but I just wanted to sketch in a little background. And um, like Justine said, I came to this story through my grandmother, who was the niece of that wealthy philanthropist who stopped into the uh, San Francisco boutique and whisked Harrison off to LA. She was the niece of Will Clark, and Will was the son of a very notorious Montana copper baron and spe spectacularly corrupt politician um, named William Andrews Clark Sr. If you know the story of Huguet Clark, um, it's that family, and um, Huguet who lived many, many streets up on, on uh, Fifth Avenue. Huguet was Will's half-sister, just to give you a little more context. Um, this, this, these are three Will Clarks, uh, the Clark Sr. on the right, Clark Jr. on the left, and Clark III, known as Tertius, in the middle. Um, this is uh, Will Clark Jr., right in the early 1900s, and this is Will Clark Jr. with my grandmother as a very little girl and her aunt Alice in Will Clark's uh, gardens in Los Angeles. Um, this is how I connect to the story. Uh, Will Clark married my grandmother's aunt, um, whose name was Alice McManus, and they did not have children of their own, and, and my grandmother, who was named Alice after her aunt, was a kind of surrogate daughter in a way for them. Um, here are some more photos. Here, here are the two Alices in the garden. That's myself and my grandmother in her garden in San Francisco. Please note the pint of coffee haagen does ice cream. Um, all right, here's Will Clark Jr. And um, right before she died in 1918, Aunt Alice realized that Will Clark had a double life and um, that included secret male lovers. Um, she, died, she died in 1918, and a year later, Will Clark met Harrison. Um, and although they took many precautions when they began their relationship, um, they were relatively open uh, for that time period. And this was also, this might be because Will was so wealthy and was doing things like creating the LA Philharmonic, which you can see here in the Hollywood Bowl. Um, back in 1919. This is the Clark Library, which he established, uh, is, in, is part of UCLA now. This is the mausoleum in Hollywood Forever Cemetery, where he is buried. And this is Harrison Post, um, maybe 1920. There he is again. There he is painted on the ceiling of the Clark Library. There he is with some of his Hollywood friends in the Pacific Palisades. He's on the right. And I like to think he's there at the bottom of that photograph of Charlie Chaplin and friends taking the picture. All right, so I'm going to read th uh, three very short passages. And um, this one begins with Harrison arriving in Los Angeles. Harrison went to the races. He went shopping, he went to parties, he threw parties, he traveled in chauffeured cars, he gave orders to servants, he swanned about town delivering rare editions of Chaucer to other handsome young men. Dilettante comes from the Latin delectare, to delight, but we finish it off like it's French, the, le the best language for contempt. The one that gives us manquet and flaneur people we can't easily categorize, people without obvious purpose. These are words that allow us to purse our lips, ironic, dismissive, the better not to take these people, whomever, whatever they are, seriously. 
An unfixed man, Harrison Post strains our usual terms, and so we turn to other languages, strange words to make a strange person even stranger. And in doing so, we admit the truth, that it's impossible to be precise about people because being a person is not a precise thing to be. A man exists whether or not the language exists to identify him. Even if he cannot be named, he can still be seen, and he can still be loved. Will had a word for Harrison, Copin. He inscribed it on a photograph of himself at the races, cigar clenched in his teeth, stopwatch in hand. Taken from below, the picture seem, makes Will seem a powerful masculine figure, barrel-chested and taller than he was. In French, copain can mean buddy or pal, but it's often used to signal romantic attachment, a more adult expression than petit ami. The term comes from compagnon, which along with the Spanish compañero, Italian compagno, and English companion, derives from Latin, cum and panis, meaning with whom one eats bread. The words we use for with whom one shares a bed are never so direct. Instead, they're burdened with social norms and contractual obligations, like wife and husband, or they're veiled in opaque business speak, partner, or recast from platonic terms and yoked to gender as with boyfriend and girlfriend. Lover at least draws on a feeling, but none of these words possesses the clarity of the bond established through sharing one of the most elemental acts in life with another person. They were happy in Rome, they were happy in Venice, they were happy in Paris, and they were happy on ocean liners, in staterooms, in private cars, in hotel suites, and in bookstores. Um, the next passage I'm gonna read takes place in 1934, and 15 years have passed since Harrison has arrived, had arrived in Los Angeles, and 1934 is the year his life suddenly snapped, as he would put it. Um, in 1934, a former employee of Will Clark's filed a defamation lawsuit against Will that threatened to expose his relationship with Harrison. And several weeks after that suit was filed, Harrison experienced a collapse, either a stroke or a nervous breakdown. It's unclear exactly what medically happened, um, but he was convalescing that spring in a sanitarium. And then in early June, a few months after that collapse, Will Clark sat for a deposition in the defamation lawsuit. The next day, he traveled to Montana where he had a heart attack and died. Um, within days, Harrison's older sister, Gladys, who was married to a car salesman named Charles Crooks, <laughs> had Harrison declared incompetent and proceeded to take over his estate in, in the Pacific Palisades and all of his assets. Um, sometimes Gladys went by the name Felice, which is what her uh, passport, uh, her Mexican passport or immigration papers here says. Um, I was not able to put these photos in the book because I couldn't get permission, but I feel confident I can show them here and they are arresting. So um, this is Gladys and this is Charles Crooks. Let's see. This is Oscar Trigestad. He, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him in just a second. But first I'm gonna read a short passage uh, from a chapter titled Exile, right after Harrison has been declared incompetent. Um, it was as if he'd been banished, though he hadn't gone anywhere. It was the kingdom that disappeared. For the past 15 years, Harrison had moved through the world, secure in the Clark Empire, buoyed upon an ocean of capital and access and servants in chauffeured cars and art and famous names. The affluence hadn't been only a matter of money, but also of love and loyalty. He'd been adored, protected, enshrined, 
painted on a ceiling. He and Will had traveled the world together. He'd grown accustomed to fine meals, beautiful clothes, opulent hotels, friendships with powerful people. He'd grown comfortable with his things, his horses, his Rolls Royce, his books, his silver, his dogs, his swans, his farm. He'd glided along, suspended by Will's wealth, which had become his as well, and by Will's love. But now the moon had vanished, the tide never to return, and he lay on the desert floor. His world was fog, fog from whatever it was that had snapped like a twig in his mind. Fog from whatever it was the nurses put in the hypos. Fog from his scrambled nerves, from his wounded brain. He'd been taken out of one room and put in another, like a thing made of sand. Now another room. It was home, they said. He didn't move. Others did. They moved and they disappeared. His butler and the housekeeper were gone. The gardeners were gone. The night watchman was gone, but Gladys was there, and him too. New footsteps, new voices in the hall outside, new staring faces, McFarland, Oliphant, Judd, that was the one with the scissors. Outside, a gate opened and closed, a car sound, a beam of light stabbed the wall, no language for any of it. No language for not having language, just pale shapes, dark shapes, something wet, something soft. Pins everywhere, pain, then fog, then not even that. Gladys hung new curtains. She drew them shut, and the world outside was gone. He was trapped inside a body that didn't move, in a mind that moved too much in all the wrong directions, and then not at all. The gate opened, a car a woman's heels, the fog was back. He woke, he wanted a book, it had been misplaced. He asked for another, it too had been misplaced. He saw and he felt and he heard, and yet he could not be seen or understood. He was alive enough to know that he'd been buried. So Harrison was held hostage for the next few years in this particularly gothic state of captivity, um, and he was eventually restored to competent, competency, um, and he was at that point extremely desperate to get away from Gladys and her husband. And one of the stranger twists in his story is that um, in 1938, he and his one of the male nurses that had been hired, um, this gentleman named Oscar Trigestad, uh, left America for Norway. And uh, Oscar's family had a hotel in a small town called Hellesilt, and it was a stop for tourists and cruise lines. And Oscar thought it would be an idyllic spot for Harrison to get away from Gladys and to recover from the harrowing ordeal he'd been through. Um, but there were other forces in 1938 that they did not consider. Um, I'm going to show you a few more photos. This is a view from Hellasilt, a postcard in, from Harrison's scrapbooks. So this is what he left the palace where he, this is the idyllic town that he ended up in. And it is an extraordinary spot in the world. Um, there he is with Oscar's nieces and nephew. And I met one of the nieces named... Um, Osa, during my research, who's now in her 80s, uh, which was an extraordinary thing. There's Harrison. He took up cross-country skiing. This is on the boat. Uh, this is when they um, sail for, this is on the steamer when they sail for uh, Oslo. This is taken uh, also on that steamer. This was his life in Norway. Um, he definitely took to it and also kept his sense of style. Um, one of the most amazing things in the research was I met not only uh, Oscar Trigestad's niece, but another 
um, the son of the tailor from the local town, also in his 80s, and both of them spoke no, very little English, and both of them made the exact gesture to evoke Harrison, which was to point to their cuffs to show how exacting he was about where his cuffs needed to fall on his arms. Um, and I thought that was extraordinary that these children, once children, now in their 80s, still remembered the exact same detail about Harrison. Let's see again. Uh, you can see what's coming. This is uh, after 1939. Uh, this is 1945, the same town. This is a British paratrooper he met after the war. That his, his, his name was Gordon Pritchard and that is Harrison's dog, Gint. That's a painting of Harrison that sits in the community center in Hellasilt today. Um, so I'm gonna read one last section, this is quite short, and then. In hindsight, it's hard to fathom that anyone could imagine Norway or any corner of Europe as a place of safety in the late 1930s. And many wouldn't have needed hindsight to know the danger, but perhaps for those accustomed to wealth, Totalitarianism is something that happens to other people, to the poor, to the middle class, to immigrants, but not to courtiers, not to aristocrats, not even the invented ones. As beneficiaries of hierarchy, they've all, they're already accustomed to the fact that their protected sphere requires exclusion. So it may be natural to believe they'll re remain untouched as a despot lunges for more power. In Germany that Christmas, people hung ornaments shaped like grenades and topped their fir trees with swastikas instead of the Star of Bethlehem. There would be no celebration of a Jewish child born in a manger. On Christmas Eve, brown-shirted stormtroopers assembled in Berlin. They didn't sing carols, but nationalist hymns. They lit bonfires and threw wreaths into the flames to commemorate their fallen comrades and they pledged their fidelity to the Fuhrer. That same month in Romania, the leaders of the National Christian Party decreed that those who'd arrived in the country after 1920, which included hundreds of thousands of Jews who'd fled Poland and Germany after the Great War, would be expelled. Borders were closing. Bulgaria wouldn't permit refugees, nor would Hungary or Yugoslavia a campaign in Austria advocated to, quote, close the gates against foreign Jews, we have enough. Harrison may not have been oblivious to the looming threat. Still, even though he'd just emerged from a harrowing state of captivity, he'd lived too long in the Clark Empire to think such danger could be meant for him. Besides, none of that was happening on the Scandinavian peninsula Berlin and Bucharest may have seemed as far from the small town nestled at the end of a Norwegian fjord as they did from Los Angeles. After Christmas, Harrison and Triga set sail for Oslo. They would travel by way of the Panama Canal. Out on the deck, they lounged, Triga shirtless with his white pants rolled up and Harrison in white wide-legged trousers and a snug white polo. He tanned quickly a black and white snapshot taken aboard the ship shows them reclining on deck chairs on either side of a younger shirtless man. Their blonde friend smiles at the camera, as does Triga, jolly and relaxed, arms outstretched. Wind lifts his fair hair. Harrison sinks back in the white canvas of his chair, his torso slightly angled toward his handsome companion, hands in his lap, though his face is turned away eyes closed, smiling. It's a fleeting moment, his head tossed, white shirt collar flaring against his dark neck, a twist in his body as he gives himself over to laughter, pleasure, maybe even peace, a man at last released, free and happy under the sun. Thank you.
amazing. Is it on? Hello? Okay. Amazing. Um, yeah. Um, I have two questions for you. But now that we're um, in front of this painting, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, about how this painting came to be and maybe just... Sure. Yeah. Um, this paint was painted by a man named Henry Barnett, and he was a prisoner from the Channel Islands who was being held uh, in an internment camp in Bavaria. Um, and Harrison met him when he was taken prisoner by the Nazis and shuttled through various POW camps. And uh, one of the most amazing things is even in the midst of captivity, being a captive of the Nazis, Harrison still had his portrait made. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Yeah. No. No, it's, <laughs> it is, it's, um, yeah, it's quite, a, it's quite extraordinary. And, I'll, I'll just yeah. add that when, that this was in the hotel, the Trigestad Hotel in Hellasilt, uh, which was torn down uh, maybe 20 years ago, and, um, everything from the hotel that remained was put out for a kind of flea market and no one bought the painting. Um, and so the daughter-in-law of the police chief um, took the painting and went to the local community center and just put a nail on the wall and hung it there. And that, that is where it is today, so. Yeah, so, so good. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's the other painting too. There's an, there, there's another portrait that you talk about um, in the book that's also kind of a framing device of him as a young man. Now I'm thinking about this painting and the first painting as being parallel to the two photographs that you were talking about framing the book. Do you want to do you want to talk about what, that? Which painting are you thinking of? The one that was eventually at Gladys's house that was done yes. by the. Um, uh, it was done by the someone who was involved in the Oscar Wilde production. I haven't, I haven't been able Re to confirm that. Oh, Th okay. that. That painter whose name was Enrique Medina and did the painting of the young Dorian Gray in the movie Dorian Gray um, also did a portrait of Will Clark yeah. that's, at the, that's in the Clark Library, um, which is uncanny because Will Clark collected the largest um, volume of Oscar Wilde's work. Um, and this was before the movie, but. That's my fun question. So I had like one pointed question yes. and one fun question, but um, <laughs> my fun question was about those letters. Um, so, so he got 25, he bought 25 of uh, these love letters um, that, that Oscar Wilde had written for some enormous price um, and then tasked Harrison Post to transcribe every letter, um, which you describe in the book as a kind of ventriloquism. I, I think that was maybe my favorite part of the book, um, just that act of, of love, of like, you know, what it is to like, um, and also there's something about um, in making a kind of a queer history um, that there are rituals that, that people do and to kind of step in the same footsteps as someone else is to, to be in solidarity or to yeah. like be, to, to, to make yourself visible. So my fun question was if, <laughs> I hope you find it. Um, if if writing the book was also for you a kind of channeling of of that of that love and those love letters, and how it affected your love life. Oh God, <laughs> that's the fun question. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun for me. <laughs> the the answer is my poor girlfriend. I mean, <laughs> who like um, who. S yes, did an incredible amount of support and like mm -hmm. uh, pulling back from lots of dark nights of the soul in this process. And um, it is extraordinary to have someone who understands that and kind of uh, mm -hmm. turns on the light. Um, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's also like, kind of a good date story to be like, I'm writing this book about these secret yeah. lovers and, yeah. you know, so <laughs> that, I mean, that didn't hurt yeah. in, um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know I if mean, I'm answering your question. No, but what, I think I, I, um, 
um, made this, these compartments in my mind because there's the pleasure of the book is to be able to like witness and share the love between Harrison Post and, and Will Clark, you know? The, yeah. So like, um, uh, and then the kind of the unfun part of it or the kind of uncomfortableness of the story is this question of wealth. Yeah. So in the book, you talk about, you use the word wardship, like right in the beginning um, and you, you connect it to the um, Indian Appropriation Act of 1871. I, I just was, um, I was just, re I was just reading to make sure I remember that. I didn't remember the painter's name, but um, uh, uh, I actually have this quote that I, I wrote down, but I'm just going to remember the quote. Um, you say something in it, um, if you're wealthy enough and powerful enough that wardship is, how do you put it? You say wardship is um, like a supposed charity that like hides the, the act of larceny and captivity um, yeah. that it really implies. And you, you talk about that in relationship to um, uh, Will Clark's father, W.A.'s, um, taking on a, like a 16-year-old yeah. girl as a ward who later becomes his wife, but is not included in the inheritance, does not, you know, yeah. is not part of the family ever, really. Um, and then um, at the end of W.A.'s life, he grooms his housekeeper's nine-year-old son and then actually does give him all of this mo money, more yeah. money than he gives <laughs> yeah. Harrison Post. Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, it was interesting, too, to think about um, uh, when you, the, the, the section that you read um, where Harrison Post is basically Gladys's ward, um, and so this kind of question of agency and wealth, I think, comes up a lot for me, and that's the unfun yeah. kind of part of it. So, like, I don't know if you have no, more to say um, about that. I mean, the, th the thing that was really a struggle with this one of the things that was really a struggle with this book was I was went into it thinking I'm going to resurrect this gay love story and kind of restore this men, these men who've been wrongfully erased. And the more I kept digging into it, the more I kept discovering that there were aspects of their lives, particularly Will's, that were really seemed pretty unsavory and. Um, and like they were, they weren't going to give me the gay martyr story I wanted, which was what I thought I was going in for. And I, and so it's. I mean, we talk a lot about different intersections today, and this is a really thorny one. This wealth, you know, for a, people who are marginalized because of their sexual orientation, and then at the same time have extraordinary power, uh, you know, enough power to create the LA Philharmonic and to buy off the DA and other things and to maybe buy a child. Um, and I mean, the, which I can't substantiate for a fact what took place between Will and this young boy, but um, the, that's a very dark legacy there very much, you know. Um, I, I just see that Lynn has her hand up, and I just want to um, introduce the room to Lynn Tillman, who um, wrote a book that's um, actually has such a lot to do with this book as well, The Ghost and Apparitions, which is also like looking at these family albums. And so I'm so I'm so excited to hear from her. Thank you. Yeah. I'm very curious with all that wealth. His housekeeper, right, is the one who forces him finally, Clark, to have to give a deposition. Oh, I'm sorry, That's a, that wasn't the housekeeper, that was his, that, those are different employees. Okay. So that's a, an accountant So okay. oh, who did the that. Accountant does, well, the what accountant did the housekeeper does. do? The housekeeper had a son who was nine, who Will um, took uh, a fatherly interest in for yeah. years, and then it okay. seems questionable about so, so my, quest, my question is, uh, the accountant, uh, what was in that deposition? What did Will say that, that uh, made um, Harrison leave immediately? What was in that? I never, um, I, the deposition doesn't exist in the legal file. It's not there. I just know that he was ordered to give it on, Jan, on June 6th, and then he left town the next day, and on June 8th, died or so you know some whatever the sequence is it's something very so quick. his wealth couldn't protect him then that's my theory is that by the end of he had already by that point been through 
um, a series of extortion and blackmail um, attempts or pay, that he paid off and was war so worn down. I, this is my theory that when it seemed that it was very likely this defamation lawsuit was going to expose them, their lives, that um, he, that that was the kind of final, the final break for him. That's my theory. But, but Lynn, um, how, because you, you have to get the book, but, um, <laughs> Oh, you have the book. Okay. Um, but I, I feel like there's, um, I'm just kind of remembering things that you've written in Ghost and Apparition about the kind of the idea of how the family album becomes, um, how, do, how do you put it, like these kind of relics that hold people together with a sense of kind of attachment and belonging, that they come together through, through these through, the fam through a family album, that it kind of concretes a togetherness. Um, and so maybe that c brings me back to the question that I asked at the end of my introduction about um, how photography functions for queer life. Yeah. Um, there are no photographs of Will and Harrison together, you know, which is interesting. And there also are no very intimate letters between the two of them, which they were both, um, they both were prolific letter writers. So I feel like those have all been destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I mean, I think they put more time into having paintings made mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. photographs. So, um, and that may just have been because of the time period they were in, that mm -hmm. photography still felt new. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, there are paint. I mean, there for Harrison, who just sort of disappears from the world. There are so many images of him. Mm -hmm. You know, not not only this one, but um, he was there. Thirteen images of him painted on the ceiling, and they definitely had yeah. <laughs> figured out this way to just sort of um, memorialize their love, mm -hmm. and and also cover their tracks at the same time. Like mm -hmm. that feels like they were they had to be very canny about doing that. I was, I guess I was thinking also just about coding, you know, like in a picture where like the hat is tipped so, mm -hmm. or like, you know, if that kind of plays out um, uh, thro throughout the pictures, like if you were to, um, you know, look at other pictures mm -hmm. of your great, great, great uncles, like they probably are not wearing such, like their cups are not probably as perfect <laughs> or, you know, so there's, there's, um, there's, it seems to me that maybe there's something about um, a kind of a secret language, and I guess mm -hmm. that brings me to that idea that your grandmother like left that for you. Um, I don't know. I mean, I find it amazing she held on to that, and I don't. And she wasn't, you know, she was a idiosyncratic lady. I knew her as an elderly woman. I did not mm -hmm. know, you know, like I think there are decades of her life that I have no understanding of, um, and. And yet it is very curious that she kept that, that photograph and no one mm -hmm. seemed to know who it was. Um, so it is one of the mysteries in the book. So I'm a teacher, I teach a lot. Um, and I like to call on people because, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just really excited that your brothers are here. Um, and um, no, I, I um, uh, one of the things my family doesn't like it when I photograph them because they want to be the narrators of their own stories. They don't want me to be the narrator of their story. And so I guess there's an opportunity here for the brothers to kind of maybe say like their piece about the family. <laughs> wow, come all the way out to New York and get put on the spot like that. Huh? That's exactly uh, why you fly out to New York. <laughs> well, um, one of the scenes that struck me maybe to the closest was the description in the early, I guess is the introduction of the house. And this is a house that I think all three of my siblings and I shared at some point while we were living in San Francisco, going to school or whatnot. And this is the house that Liz describes um, so perfectly. I mean, when I read this, the room, the wallpaper, uh, the tone of the house, uh, where the dressers were, it really hit home, and maybe you could just describe or 
confirm what you were going through when you described the Vallejo house, uh, street house. What's the, uh, well, just <laughs> what, what was going through your mind when you described the house? Because uh, that obviously hit home to us. Um, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I feel like that was said, that it, is this sort of strange, mysterious place with all these um, closets and ways to hide in it, you know, and that there are ways that I certainly needed to hide at times. So it just really was this physical place. But it was also, I think, I mean, this is a funny, I, it's sort of hatching this idea in the moment, but um, I think something very singular about our family, which many of you may know, is we didn't have television as kids growing up, but my grandmother did. <laughs> and so that house is also a place where we could watch TV together. And uh, somehow I feel like there's, even though it wasn't the house we grew up in, you know, it wasn't our house in Chico, it had this other, I feel like this, something was allowed there that maybe wasn't in other places. And there was a way, I don't know, there's a way when you're, as a family, watching TV where you can be together, but you're not, like, on top of each other, and your attention is directed outward. Um, and I don't know, I really treasure that about that house, like having that way to just kind of hang out together. Because um, there wasn't, there in our, in our childhood home, there isn't exactly that same kind of space. So, you know, that's, a, that's another book. <laughs> <laughs> Holly might want it. This is my sister, Holly. Speaking of TV, can you talk about the connection between Harrison Post and Britney Spears? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, some may already know this, but um, the Britney Spears' story of being declared incompetent and her father taking over and squandering or siphoning off her vast estate bears a very direct parallel to Harrison's story. And when it was coming out in the news, I was very attuned to that and kept following the story um, and realized that the parallels were actually far more, un far more uncanny than I had expected in which um, the neurologist that declared Harrison Post incompetent in 1934, his name was Samuel D. Ingham and he was um, a neurologist that would later uh, found the Department of Neurology I think at USC and um, was a very revered figure in the medical community. And his grandson, Samuel D. Ingham III, is the attorney who was appointed by the court in the same Superior Court of Los Angeles to, to represent Britney Spears. Oh, weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it feels like there is a very direct lineage there, and um, it's unclear whether that the family, this is a family industry, or the younger Ingham, it's possible to imagine that he mm -hmm. could see there was a profit stream to be um, taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. so. Bring, bringing up Britney Spears um, makes me think of the part in the book where you talk about Kim Kardashian, which is a really kind of um, amazing also. <laughs> other, so for people who didn't read it, maybe you could, um, you could talk about that. Sure. Um, the picture I showed of the cemetery, Hollywood Forever Cemetery, uh, on, which is um, Melrose, I think on Melrose, um, and has, you know, uh, Valentino is buried there, one of the uh, Ramones is buried there, like everyone's, you know, it's a cemetery of fame, and um, the largest mausoleum is Will Clark's, and um, there's an episode of the Kardashians, in, and also you're not supposed to be able to go in that mausoleum unless you're a direct descendant, um, which there don't, none exist anymore, but um, I've managed to get in there, Scotty has managed to get in there, um, and the Kardashians have managed to get in there, <laughs> and they are not direct descendants, um, but they, uh, one of the episodes in the, keep, Keeping Up with the Kardashians takes place in which they go in 
and in one and sort of are kind of trying to decide how they want their mausoleum to look, and they're using this as their uh, model, and so much so that Chris Kardashian climbs up on Aunt Alice's tomb and lies there. Um, yeah, so that's. <laughs> it, it brings up, there's a, this really great section in the book where you talk about like real estate in LA and like the LA basically um, the, the product that they were selling were these homes um, and you talk about a shift. Oh, there was this really beautiful part too where you describe the West as, uh, how did you put it, the boundary between resources that have been monetized and resources that have not been monetized. Um, but then after the the... Clark Empire has like you know stripped all of the copper. Um, uh, that the next kind of commodity coming out of LA are these stars. So there's yeah. this really kind of interesting thing, parallel actually between the Kardashians and you know the um, yeah the Hollywood the, of the of the of the Harrison Post years. Yeah, I mean I think of copper. It was this very clear material commodity that was. Um, that the Clark Empire was um, monopolizing, and then Hollywood created this uh, kind of materiality of fame and celebrity, and um, and I think now attention is the commodity. Like how much we are looking at our phones, like that, like our own selves are, and our minds are the commodity that is being mined. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, do, do you guys have, are there more questions from the audience members? Or maybe, oh, yep, we have another. I can share. I would love to know more about the sister and Crooks, her husband, and what you were able to find out about them and what they went on to do. They seem yes. fascinating. Yes. Yeah, they, um, I do not know what their final days consisted of. The last trace, they, after, after they defrauded Harrison of his estate and he fled to Norway, um, they built a house in the Palisades with his money um, and outfitted it beautifully. There's a brochure of it in, Santa, in the uh, UC Santa Barbara in their archives, uh, their architectural archives. Um, and then suddenly in 1941, they fled to Mexico City. Uh, it, they seemed to have to leave very quickly. And um, <laughs> I don't know exactly what was going on, but, um, but a lot of people were fleeing to Mexico City very quickly to escape taxes or also um, Mexico City was kind of, it was like the safe Casablanca. Like there was a lot of deal making, wartime deal making and selling of oil and things like that happening there. Um, and they set up shop with what they still had of his, um, his estate. And then, and they were even palling around with a German woman named Hilda Kruger, who had been literally the poster child for the Third Reich, was like literally on posters of Aryan su supremacy. <laughs> that was one of their close friends in Mexico City. Um, the, they stayed in Mexico City. He came back and tried to track them down. And I won't, if you haven't read it, I'm not going to tell you how that turns out. But they, um, the last trace I found was that Charles Crooks was um, arrested in 1974 for fraud mm -hmm. in Mexico City. And I don't, and that was through a kind of State Department uh, fax or something like that. Like it, it was just a, it, it, I couldn't get the legal records, but just the fact that he had was still doing nefarious dealings. So, but there's also what about like bef prior to the um, like in Chicago um, wasn't like Gladys involved in like car heists and like um, there was like she's a really amazing character. She actually. is. <laughs> yeah, there was. Yeah, she and her mom were coming out of a theater and their car was stolen and all their jewels were taken and um, that totaled $5,000 and then I'm trying to remember what the other, th they kept always having their jewels stolen 
their insured jewels stolen, and then she was involved also with the boxer, Ki not romantically, but with the boxer Kid McCoy, who was involved with some jewel smuggling ring. I mean, it, yeah. yeah. They, I have two questions. One, what did your mom think of the book? Because you talk about her in the beginning and yeah. you dedicate it. And yeah. my second question is when the uh, Times review first appeared, some of the comments were like, this is so cinematic, it should be made into a movie. Any plans for a screenplay? Or um, uh, first question, my mom, who I spent like seven years anticipating and terrorized about what she would think of the ultimate result. Um, when I sent it to her, I sent it to her right before it came out. I didn't give her much lead, much lead time, um, but she called and said she thought it was beautiful. Um, and she's read it three times. <laughs> she's asked to read some of the books in the bibliography. I think she's checking my research. Um, she hasn't said much about the introduction and that's fine. <laughs> I'm okay with that. But it's 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 that has that has gone well, um, which is nice to say. And as for cinematic, um, I hope you're right. And um, there are like murky like murky conversation. Uh, I say there are conversations, but but nothing concrete, like nothing. So we'll see. But the sharks crossed. are circling. <laughs> I want, I'm hoping, I, you know, I want a little more blood in the water to get the, <laughs> I, want, I want some more sharks. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, just be curious, you did a, you had a lot of information in there about the Norwegian prisons yeah. and then the transference down to Germany. That was fascinating. Where did you get all that information? Because you could even name the, his co-inmates and that type of thing, which was and pretty vivid memories of, on their part. Yeah, there was um, one of the most extraordinary discoveries in the research was a POW memoir called something like A Thousand Nights. I, I don't know how you say that in Norwegian, but um, written by a man named Kara Viken, who um, was... Uh, had been arrested by the Nazis and um, had been part of the Norwegian resistance and had been taken prisoner. And um, it includes a chapter titled Doblet Millionaire fra Sa Santa Monica. <laughs> and there is a chapter about the millionaire from Santa Monica who he shared a cell with. And Harrison is there with that picture of him with, the, with Gint. Is in this is in this POW's memoir, um, and it's an amazing. That was amazing. I mean, th there were certain moments where I just thought, I, I can't believe this exists, and I, I can't believe I found it. Google. I, I just I Google. I went into Google Books, and there's some little search part where if you just plug in the link, you know, a search term or a few terms, and this this came up. Um, that was extraordinary. I have I have the book, uh, and I got someone to translate it for me. Um, and then there were I went to I toured the museum. It's a museum at Greeny outside of Oslo that had been one of the um, one of the main main detention centers uh, for prisoners um, during the Nazi occupation. Um, and there was a former prisoner who was giving tours and talks uh, quite a bit about the circumstances and showed me, and he had, and I remember he got out this big book that had um, all the transfers and we found Harrison in it to see when he had been transferred to, uh, to Germany. So. Harrison was, yeah, yeah, very few. Um, I don't, I think he was, I mean, and he was very much a novelty and sort of seemed to like use that to his advantage. So he, he had the like, worst instincts, survival instincts and some of the best survival instincts. I don't know. Any more questions? Should we, could proceed to the garden and ask questions in person? Yes, let's do yes, that. Yes, let's do that. Thank you.